Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage. Day two of theCUBE, day three of Databricks' Data AI. So I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, with Savannah Peterson, Rob Stretcher, George Gilbert, the whole team here. We've got the two CUBE Collective VIPs, Sanji <laughs> Mohan with Sanjo, and then Tony Baer, principal of DB Insights. Guys, thanks for coming on as part of the CUBE Collective, Thank contributing you. to our open source analyst angles. Great um, to see you guys again, are John. the pros, both legends in the data community. We've seen the waves of innovation. Yeah, the ball moves down the field, inch by inch, sometimes goes far. Now we're in a whole nother era. You're seeing a lot of maybe yeah. potential big moves coming. And Databricks is laying down a lot of strong game here by going for the long game, by saying, hey, we're going to open source things. We're going to go for formats. Does their conjecture match the reality of the customers? And, or is this Databricks just doing the, their, their thing? Next level. What's your take? Okay, let's see if we can take it for 100,000 feet. Part of, this is, part of this I see is like a whole, there's a lot of, there's perception, and then there's some differences. And obviously there was another event here a week, you know, you know last week, um, what I call the, you know, the Snowbridge month. And the thing is, on one hand, we have Snowflake basically is in a more mature market, which is data warehousing. Databricks is in a market which is a lot less mature, which is you know, the data but and AI market. Now, they're both going into the same places. I think there's a lot of interest on the open source side. I think the challenge, and I'll just make this short on this one, we can go back into more detail, but I think the challenge for Databricks is that their history of open source, aside from Apache Spark, has been you know, you know, projects that Databricks has been largely you know, at, at the helm of, whereas basically, when you look at, let's say, like Iceberg, it was a more of a community project, more, you know, more contributors. So I think, I think the open source, especially open sourcing of, you know, of, um, of Unity, is an excellent development. Um, on the other hand, I think there's some perceptions here that Databricks has to overcome, to overcome the fact that, the, you know, the, or the perception that they're actually controlling this. Got it. Sanjay, what's your take on the big picture? So on a big picture, what we are hearing from customers and what we saw last week at Snowflake Summit and here is that there is a massive integration of the data and AI stack that is happening and it's all coming together. Last week, we were all pretty much taken aback by the Databricks tabular uh, 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 merging and we were thinking that, oh my God, this is such a big news, but I am, I'm happy to report that Table formats are not the topic. They're not the center of topic. No. They're a much bigger picture. What right. Databricks is doing with like Lakehouse Federation or the new uh, ETL that they're doing with Lakeflow, mm -hmm. where they you can connect to not just Snowflake but SAP, Salesforce. You can right. do ETL. You can do sharing of data. You can do clean rooms. I, I really feel yeah. that that both. Snowflake and Databricks, to be on, uh, to be uh, fair, are really innovating, and they're helping their customers yes. really focus on uh, on data products, AI assistants, agents, co-pilots, and think less about table formats and ETL. And so there's a lot of automation, lot of, like Lakeflow. You can do so much of transformation without writing a single line of code. Right. So you're thinking. So what jumped out at you is the federation was good, but don't you need the data formats to be compatible? So it's, it's in the weeds for sure. I mean, it's not yeah. a big country. But Correct. if you get that right, yes, the enablement's strong. Right. So okay. So you do need formats, but not for everything. You need uh, a table format if you're going to have structured data and you want any compute engine on top. But when you do AI, then the table formats don't come in the picture. When you do data sharing, again, you need delta sharing as a standard, but not the table format. So there are many, so sure. there's, there's a lot of standardization going on of, of uh, access points. Yeah, the other thing too also, and I think you're just you know, you're working up to that and what you were saying is that at the end of the day, Vendors are not differentiating on table format. We just want to get that issue out of the yeah, way. Move it, yeah, get it done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every, in every major inflection point in my career, I've seen things like TCP IP was a standard, yeah. de facto standard, right. Kubernetes, cloud, cloud native. It is the unification of the, of, the, of the governance piece, the catalog, is that the area that this world needs to standardize or de facto agree or unify around? 
to make data engineering truly scale because with all the fragmentation, mm -hmm. yeah. there could be a food fight all day long. Every year will be right. a food fight. Right, right. Table formats today, yeah. my federation versus yours. Right. I mean, at what point is there some sort of consensus? Yeah. Well, and what would that look like? Well, put it this way, I think federation will be one area that still will be highly contested, just as data sharing is, and of course, obviously, Databricks' strategy is to, is to open source it, and they do have a fairly, you know, pretty, you know, <clears throat> pretty impressive ecosystem of, of supporters you know, coming out of the gate. Um, I do think in the data federation part, and, and in the catalog part, that's where you get to the point of like, who really sort of owns this data? Who controls this data? Who governs it? What's the point of governance? What's the point of discovery? And that's really where the value add starts. Yeah. So, to, uh, in my, uh, when I look at this, the, this question comes up almost every day. What is the moat that yes. I should protect? Yes. So, uh, and, you know, people thought uh, all these <coughs> large language models are moat, but they're not, because uh, the only mo uh, the only thing with them, there's no technology moat. It's like who has the money to spend, yeah, yeah. and how can you distribute? Like if you have Google's of the world, then even with a few missteps with Gemini, you still, you have a distribution and you have a lot of money. Uh, OpenAI, Azure. So then the question is where, what is a mode, and that mode is in metadata, governance, yes. federation, ETL, and I think whoever owns that simplified integrated stack, right, right has the, the benefit. They so, can do, like for example, I'll, just to complete, like you can use any BI tool, you can have a semantic layer. So uh, last year, John, you and I actually went to bat that uh, Databricks is missing semantic layer. Yeah. Guess what, this is, it's front and center. So you got semantic yes. layer, you got lineage, you got ingestion. Yeah. Yeah. The data intelligence platform, DIP. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <on> NIM, man. <laughs> <laughs> Love Jensen's comment yesterday. It's almost as good as NIM. Uh, he's so funny on stage. He, 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 was that, he really is. You know, he wings that too. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. And he got like close to twenty minutes on stage. You know, that that was like, whoa, we're yeah. we're, we're, we're reading the Jensen minutes. Yes. Uh, Ollie was laughing. We could see him smiling. He was loving every minute of it. Um, yes. Uh, who wouldn't? Um, so okay, you're seeing the data platforms grow. You're basically Correct. saying so. There only can be a couple really intelligent data platforms out there. The big get bigger. Okay, and so in every inflection point, not only is there standards, there's also times where we as analysts or industry participants will look at a company, whether we're a VC or an analyst, that's not a company, that's a feature. <laughs> so as you start to see lake flow and these other things come out, yeah. there are companies that do these things, that's right, and yeah. they're funded. And yeah, so the trouble. question is, do they go away and still classic, you're yeah. going into the storm where they're going to yeah. dominate, where Databricks will have a solution, or, are they going to do the AWS model where there's, oh, we have a product, you can be differentiated. I'm not sure I see it that way, but what do you guys see? I see it that way. I think Which way? In trouble. Which way? I think a lot of, like, I don't want to mention these companies by, the, by their names, but like data transformation and all, yeah. I think they're in trouble. Yeah. Which yeah. categories get sucked into the big platform, and then, and then the next yeah. question is, obviously, Ali's saying, I love the ecosystem, it's super important to our business. Where does the ecosystem flower out? What's the, where's the soil, it's the It's where the value comes, and I think, I think a really good example is I think what you know, Databricks has shown from the Mosaic, you know, I keep coming up, was it, was it Mosaic ML or Mosaic AI? I think last year was Mosaic ML, and this year- They changed their names they from changed ML to the AI, it's yes, AI exactly, watching. exactly. But I think that's going to tr prove to be like a real, um, uh, that's going to be real, prove to be real sleeper. I mean, they've actually from that, and, and they, I mean, some of this come from Mosaic, some was from internal development, but they put this all under kind of a common platform of being almost, I mean, they're putting together, I mean, we're at the beginning it's of this. It's all the tooling. Of, of, exactly, of a complete life cycle for, for, for basically developing and building these models. It's, it's an app, to me, it's an app suite. So, I mean, I exactly. think the fact that they started the keynote today with the small language models, yes. I think was a North Star saying, hey, models are important, your data is important, and don't buy the hype from OpenAI. Right. Models will talk to each other, they'll be protected, but they're going to be in, obviously, Mosaic AI. Mm -hmm. So they're teeing that up. But I think that was a smart move because you got to give that the headroom. The yeah. bridge to the future oh, is going to be a yes. reset of the entire data engineering fabric. So the question is, what does that look like? And again, which companies survive and thrive, and which companies, what do they pivot to? Yeah. So yeah, where are the yeah. opportunities to add value, and then, because you've got right. Snowflake's doing the same thing. Right, right. Amazon and Azure, they got sure, the big, they're sure. big companies. So at some point, the platform will assume the largest enterprises. Right. Yeah, mid-market, yeah. people can so, ha have some little yeah. patch of grass there, but. You know, yesterday, we were in a session with Ali. Yes, yes. And a lot of stuff, we, uh, we're not at, 
liberty to talk <laughs> about. But you know, I asked him this question because CEO of a very prominent company behind us uh, was complaining about the competition now they're getting from Databricks. And so, and then so there's this ecosystem versus competition. And Ali's answer was brilliant. He basically said that we are not at his level. He's not going to play favorites. But we live in a capitalist society. Best product should win. So mm -hmm. he's told his product team to build the best product yeah. and compete at merit. But then, you know, he at his level, he's going to maintain the ecosystem. Yeah, but there's some categories that we were just talking about that just absolutely fall into a core competency of right, data right, bricks. Right, for right, them, right. For their stuff to happen, right. they just you can't just co-op petition those. Right, you got to right. own them. Microsoft went through this in the 80s and 90s when yes. they were building out the, the Windows same ecosystem. Story. You remember that yeah. same thing? Yeah. Amazon didn't have that problem because they weren't in the app business. Right. So they were in the compute business. Yeah. Exactly. Everyone, they were an arms dealer. Well, the other you thing know? too is also, I think this is sort of an extension of the backlash against what we used to call the modern data stack. And that the modern data stack was supposed to be modern, but it was really complex. It was very complex tool chains. You had to put all the pieces together. It was like, kind of like the best of breed all over again. And the fact is, in a more complex world, we want simplicity, so I think there is something to be said for the fact that we are seeing more of a, a drift towards platform plays. There will be some specialized yeah. you know, providers of, mo of do I think, domain-specific models. I really like the whole small language model thing, the Neek Shell and Hair at the Hearth. Yeah, I, I agree. So how would you compare, I mean, I did a post on this before the event, that the Hadoop ecosystem could look a little bit like this, you know, complex stack, not a lot of yeah, ecosystem. Yeah. But I think the serverless announcement got my attention. Hmm. One, because that's going to take away a lot of the knobs that, from yeah. a deployment standpoint right. yeah. and cost. I'm not sure if that was one of the convenient things, but also Amazon's all 100% serverless too, so like serverless is a good architecture. So to me, I, that might make it easier. Yes. And some of the Unity catalog features I saw today and, and with Delta, Delta Lake, they're automating a lot of stuff that's getting better. Yes. You got yeah. metrics in there now, so yeah. starting to see some, yeah. some, uh, some progress right, from right, Databricks right. on the product side. Yeah. The question is, what customers are adopting it? What are you guys seeing from the customer side? Are customers buying the Databricks concepts? Are they leaning in? Yeah. Um, not always, so, the conjecture might not always translate, but for well, the most part it does. You tend to, look, at, at a conference like this, obviously it's going to skew towards those that are going to be more you know, leading adopters. Um, I'm still seeing a lot of discussion with a lot of clients, basically, between we have Snowflake and we have Databricks, and they are going to continue to coexist, and we have to figure out how do we basically you know, rationalize this. So I think that's really still a very dominant thing. The fact is, like within any organization, you're going to be having these dueling platforms. The thing is, it's better to have dueling platforms than to have dueling, you know, like, you know, basically very complex tool chains of like hundreds yeah, yeah. of tools. <laughs> I love that comment you made about the, earlier about value um, creation, that's where the action will be. Yeah. What I liked about the keynote today from Ali, words like the Databricks kernel, they're, they're, they're nerds, they're talking about building almost like an operating system, and what we haven't yeah. talked about yet is, if data's going to be the lifeblood of a neural network infrastructure with knowledge graphs and new kinds of data structures, and you get the governance right, the data can just do its thing. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's the question. What's, what's after Databricks Snowflake? Whether they collide and kill each other, or they collide and coexist, there's going you to be a- You take it first. There's oh, going okay. to be a post, conversation or layer of yeah. operating environment. Yeah, I, 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 obviously, you know, they're going after the same part of gold, so they will have collision, but I, I just think that the part of gold is too big for, yeah. they don't need to have that aura of the colliding and the political moves. They can both thrive, I still feel that Snowflake has some distinct advantages. Uh, even, you can see with the keynote, the key, how did the keynote start? We were trying to diagnose a neurodiagnostic theorem with like formulas, I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's it's nerdy, heavy, and exactly. today's even more nerdy. Exactly. Yeah. So was good. I mean, I so liked it. You don't see that at Snowflake, so I, no, I think no. Snowflake still has uh, a lot of good things happening for them, as does Databricks. Yeah. Uh, the use cases are very wide and broad, and I, a lot of my clients, actually 45% overlap. Uh, yeah. That's the ETR data between Snowflake yeah. and, and Databricks, you know? Well, and Snowflake that has not changed the, in 
Snowflake ran the table on the business analytics on the cloud. Right, right. So they yeah. have all that business con right. content. I mean, well, here's a good example of how I think they're going to differentiate. Because the fact is, even though they're both coming towards the same to the same place, they both have their you know where, where they're coming from. They, they've served different constituencies, and I think one of the things that's been like you know overlooked is Snowflake Cortex. If you think about it, take a look at what they're doing with Universal Search. They're putting all the complexities of RAG in you know you know under you know you know under the hood. So therefore, and, and that really kind of typifies or you know basically the type of you know, end user, you know, the constituent that Snowflake addresses. That's the type of thing which is foreign to Databricks. So they both are going to have, come at it from yeah. different directions and have different users, different you know, categories of users for which it's going to be, you know, yeah. home turf. So Tony, one thing that I see as a little bit of a risk yeah. with both the company right. is that they both had their core personas. Right. Like data analyst for right. Snowflake, data engineer, data scientist for sure. uh, Databricks and now they want to cater and be everything to all uh, and, uh, personas. And I think yeah. that... That's the nature of competition in our business, yeah, yeah, frankly. Yeah. I mean, like, and the fact is, is look, look, I did a, a piece years ago, um, uh, this is during the Hadoop era, and it was also during the era of like the flowering of like all these NoSQL yeah. databases. And I basically said, look, there are a lot, what we found out was that there was a Cambridge explosion, we had all these different needs, but in the long run, there was going to be like a, you know, kind of a convergence. Not that all databases were going to be the same. In other words, like, yes, you can do JSON and Oracle, but if you're just doing pure document database for application, you're going to go to Mongo. The fact is, there is going to be a convergence, but each yeah. are going to have their unique areas yeah. of strength. I think there'll be a lot of diversity of data storage, data sources, right. for sure. Right. Diversity of models, that yes. you pointed out. I think she's right on, and that right on to get behind small language models. We've yeah. been reporting on that. Right. That's going to be a big part of the software data integration right. of apps. You got to have the small models. Exactly. You know, we keep forgetting how we've gone through many gyrations of trying to bring everything together in one yes. place, right? I mean, Decades. corporate data factory, uh, enterprise data warehouses, we've, we've actually, so it seems like the pendulum has shifted again. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be a very heterogeneous environment, whether we like it or not. And others have, uh, have a good chance of, of being strong players. Oracle, Cloudera, IBM, Watson Extra Data. I think they'll all... Yeah, well that's a good point. Let's bring that up. I want to just, because I think we talked about this before. Those were major initiatives, but they didn't bring a lot of structural change to the overall fabric Correct. of an enterprise. Like right. IT and how people organize. Right. Like if you look at intranets and internet and email, and then that changed IT top of rack switches versus Correct. installing office on PCs and running around with disks. So IT was born. That was a structural change mm -hmm. that was a generational shift in, in how money was spent, how IT was built, databases integrated, more so. But I think Gen AI brings that structural yeah. like shift. It's a whole nother thing. So the question is, does the tail wag the dog or does, is IT now whoever controls the infrastructure? And so the question is, if I got the business I, users, I have a at, Favorite tagline. Okay, so go ahead. Let's, I, yeah. I, a favorite yeah. tagline from yesterday, what we heard. Gen AI gets us the introductions, and then the discussion shifts to right. machine learning and ETL. Right. That's where the work is. So, There was this popular yeah. perception, and I actually wrote a piece for SiliconANGLE some months back to say that there's more to AI than Gen AI, but the popular perception, yeah. because ChatGPT has, you know, it was kind of, kind of like a consumer tail wagging the dog was, oh, it's all Gen AI. Well, yeah. underneath it, we have a lot of predictive analytics, and the fact is, if you want something that's deterministic, yeah. you're not going to go to a generative approach. So do you think this, there'll be structural change that'll be, that'll be different, that'll be a forcing function, or it's a minor tweak in? Uh, no, it's going to be a major generational change, but it's going to take some time for all this to kind of sift itself out, mm -hmm. and so, so I mean, you know, you know, another you know, another thing that that I that you know, post I'd written recently was that there's a lot of excitement about this. The vendors are actually under the gun right now to have to put an enormous investment. But the thing is, enterprises are just starting to digest this. They're just kicking the, yeah. you know, they're just, you're just, you know, basically kicking the tires. And also, it's like, we're seeing rapid innovation in terms of how we're doing yeah. models. I mean, they were, you know, transformers, now we're seeing, like, you know, a certain mixture of experts. We're starting to see kind of this yeah. more, you know, kind, you know, kind of like ensemble approach. And it's amazing how, like, the, and the fact is, it's going to take time for all the debris to sell to figure out, yeah. okay, what are going to be the sustainable yeah. approaches? So it's going to be several years before this market really yeah. materializes. It's, it's debris and also fog's got to lift, too. It's like, where yes. are we? Uh, what's your take on that, his point there? Yeah, I, um, I uh, 
Gen AI may be attracting all the, uh, all the attention, but to get it right is a very, very tough top uh, oh. job. We are now finally facing it after almost two years of, of trying to do it. The idea was in 2023, we'll do experimentation. In 2024, we'll go production. But we are nowhere <laughs> close to being production. So no now we've got rag, we've got types of rag, like graph rag, we've mm -hmm. got fine tuning has now become a very important topic yeah. at this yeah, conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. and then we even talk about training small language models. So, so we basically uh, at a stage where LLMs are amazing for basic language tasks like summarization, recommendations, mm -hmm. but when it comes to doing reasoning, and more complex tasks, which is what the customers want at the end of the yes, day. We yeah. still have a lot of work to do. So It's just the beginning. Yeah, we are at the very, uh, I, I would say we are the first inning. Yeah. Generative does not do reasoning. It's basically, it's a huge probability model on steroids. Yeah. Okay, reinforced learning no can context. come in. Yeah. All right, Tony, Sanjeev, great to have you on. As always, you guys have been following the industry for uh, decades, and, and re more recently, this big data movement is now happening. Yeah, okay, yes. I'm starting to see some action. Um, for the last minute we have left, put a plug into some of the work you guys are working on. I know you talk to a lot of customers, certainly talk to all the vendors, they want to talk to you actually. But you got a lot of customer stuff going on. What are you guys digging into? What are you uh, unpacking in your research these days? Well, Tony, we'll start with data you. Data is still important. Don't forget data. I'll just put it at that. Yeah. <laughs> My, my main interest is on what is going to be the next platform. So Gen AI becomes another compute rather than a standalone yeah. piece. So that's where I've been. And you buy compute separating from data as a, a legit thing? Oh yes. 100%? Yes. Yeah. 100%. Well, I think yeah. we, we got to that, that like five years yeah. ago. Yeah. Genie's out of the bottle there. Yeah. Now we're going to see some meat on the bone. Guys, thanks so much. You're watching theCUBE, we're day two live. John Furrier, your host, with Savannah Peterson, George Gilbert, Rob Streche, and of course, the CUBE Collective Analysts here. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>